This is Voluminous, a listening books podcast for every kind of reader, but especially for fans of audiobooks. I'm Jessica Stone, and hello! It's been a while. I think it's safe to say a few things have happened in the world since our last series of episodes. Many of us who can are working from home, some are on furlough leave, some are working hard to provide medical care or other essential services, and all of us, I hope, are doing what we can to protect each other during the pandemic. We're back with two special episodes because, in what can feel like a very isolating time, we at Listening Books have found both company and comfort in books. This week, we're delighted to share a conversation my colleague Amy had with writer and comedian Adam Buxton about his new book, Ramble Book. Could you just start by introducing yourself and your book, Ramble Book? Sure. Well, my name is Adam Buxton. I am a 51-year-old male man, and I am married with three human children and one dog child. And I live out in the Norfolk countryside. In the 90s, I was on television. I've been on television since the 90s, but not very often. But in the 90s, I got my first TV job with my school friend, Joe Cornish. And we made a show called The Adam and Joe Show, which was a sort of homemade... uh, Well, we used to describe it as Wayne's World meets The Late Review. (laughs) There's a 90s set of references for you. And we made the whole thing genuinely ourselves with camcorders and we we did spoofs of TV shows and movies with toys, Star Wars toys and stuffed toys. And we did sketches and we roped in my dad as well, Nigel Buxton. And um, he was kind of a, a stuffy, grumpy old conservative guy. And he died uh, in 2015, at the end of 2015. And he was age 91 at that point. And I'd been asked a few times to write a book over the years um, and always felt as if I didn't really have anything to write about. I've had a very fortunate and uneventful life. (laughs) So I didn't really think I had anything to say that much. Um, But after my dad died, I felt a strong sense that I was having some sort of midlife crisis. Also, a few weeks after my dad died, David Bowie died. And I'd always been a massive David Bowie fan. And I really felt, I I think I felt sadder about the fact that David Bowie had died than my dad just at that moment in in that week. But that may have been something to do with the fact that I'd been caring for my dad for about nine months by that, by the time that he died. He was living with us here in Norfolk because he had cancer. And so when he died, it was just a weird combination of sadness and a bit of relief you know what I mean but when Bowie died that felt like the floodgates opening and I I really felt like oh yeah I'm really sad I miss David Bowie and I miss my dad and I'm old and all those feelings encouraged me to think that maybe I could write about some of that and so that's what my book is that's a very long-winded answer about what my book is it's a sort of combination of reflections about my relationship with my dad, a little bit about my relationship with David Bowie as a fan. And also it is a an account really of all the cultural impacts that there were for me in the 80s. Uh, all the music and the films and the TV I was into at the time and how they ended up shaping me uh, in various ways. And also during that decade, I met and became friends with Joe Cornish um, and Louis Theroux, who was at the same school as me. And I talk a little bit about why my parents felt that it was so important that I went to a private school and a boarding school and how that affected me and, and how I feel about those things now. And so it's all those things. And also a little bit of reflection about my own family and having kids of my own and taking stock, basically, as a kind of middle-aged bloke. I was going to ask you about uh, how your book focuses so much on your early life and, and your, the way you've been influenced by film and music and everything. But is that why you decided to focus on, the, on those things? But is that because that's sort of the place you were at the, the time that you wrote it and that's what you felt most comfortable writing about? 
as opposed to kind of other things you could have talked about in your life and other bits of your career? Well, I suppose I ended up focusing on all that pop culture stuff because that's really the way that I started writing the book. At first, I didn't have much of an idea of how I was going to approach the thing. I knew that I was going to talk about my dad a little bit and maybe a bit about David Bowie, but I wanted the thing to be funny. I didn't want it all to be like, oh, I miss my dad and my dad died and oh, he was grumpy and oh, he was a bit of a Tory. And I don't, you know, there's a bit of that. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got to wrestle with that stuff. But at the same time, I did want it to be funny and I did want it to reflect my main enthusiasms, which tend to be kind of pop cultural. And really, that's how I got a career in the first place was me and Joe taking the piss out of a lot of that stuff, you know, movies and TV shows and music. Even though we loved all that stuff, you know, we had that kind of um, satirical attitude towards it, if you like. So it made sense to me that I would put my friendship with Joe in context by actually forensically analyzing all the stuff that I was into. And, and it turned out that that was the thing that unlocked a lot of memories for me, was looking through the charts, first of all, the top 40. At, at first, all I was going to do was go through every year of the 80s and make lists and just say, these are my top 10 films, and these were all the songs I was into. Not too many books, because I could barely read. And that's all it was going to be. It was like lists in between chapters about my dad and my family and things like that. But then I found that going back and looking at the top 40 for, I don't know, you know, March 1982, if I looked at what was in the top 40 then, it just fired off a huge number of very vivid and precise memories about what I was doing at the time, who I was hanging out with, you know, I could remember smells and snatches of conversation and clothes that I would wear and what was on my wall at home in my bedroom, all sorts of things. It was quite weird. It was like being hypnotized almost. And I think it was because I really loved the charts. I loved the top 40. And especially towards the beginning of the 80s when I kind of got into that music and then on to a lesser degree throughout the rest of the 80s when I discovered Bowie and that sent me off on lots of other expeditions. But um, certainly for the first five years of the 80s or something, that top 40 I was intimately familiar with from month to month. And I, I liked pretty much everything. There was very little that would come into the top 40 that I just thought, no, that's terrible. At that point, I was so enthusiastic and so into all that music. I was, uh, I knew it all. And so reading it back, that, that was the thing that really reminded me of a lot of stuff. Yeah, I quite liked how you uh, mentioned uh, a few albums and things that you didn't like at first and then you just would listen to some more and they'd be like, no, no, actually, yeah, I like it. You think it was awful at first and then you eventually come around to it. <laughs> that was the way that almost, I mean, I think that's the way I am still, actually. I'm always quite suspicious and I think maybe quite unadventurous by nature and I tend to think like, oh, no, I don't like that. And um, that's not what I'm used to. And that that represents a change and I fear change. Um, so um, it takes me a while. I, I've, I've worked out that it's about five years, I reckon. If some if everybody is raving about some film or album that you have to see or listen to, then there's a good chance that in about five years time, I'll catch up and go, oh, I get it. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> yeah. So all the stuff that was big in 2015, just getting into now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so is this the first time that you have written a book or do you have like a, a novel in a drawer somewhere or anything like that? Have you ever kind of attempted anything kind of uh, longer like this before? Or No, never have. I'm always, yeah, I've never really done anything too substantial. I think Previous to this, the most substantial thing that I did was I co-wrote a sitcom for Channel 4. Um, when was it? It was ages ago. I don't even remember when it was. Maybe 2006 or something like that. And it was called The Last Chances. It was about a band in Brighton. And no one really saw it. It kind of came and went. It was all right. It was pretty good, actually. But... Um, that was the biggest thing that I'd done up to that point. 
and since really until I did this book. Other than that, it's all been, you know, I work at just very short lengths and, uh, you know, between somewhere between 30 seconds and at the very most 10 minutes, that's about my limit for, um, being able to create some, some kind of coherent creative experience. And I, uh, believe that the audiobook for Ramble Book, that was released before the print version. Is that right? That came out beforehand. Yeah. So when you were writing the, the book, did you kind of, were you primarily thinking of it as an audiobook? Um, and if you were, how did that affect the way you wrote it and your like creative process? Well, I had both things in mind. Obviously, I had what's this going to look like on the printed page in mind. And I was very keen that the physical thing should be beautiful and should look nice, should have a good cover, should be nicely laid out, should be well illustrated and all those things, you know, should be a lovely object to own. I'm glad to say that it is thanks to uh, people at HarperCollins who did a great job on the design and Helen Green, who's a brilliant illustrator who does the artwork for my podcast. So I'm glad about that. And I hope, and it was designed to be easy to read, definitely and to, to flow well and not be something that you would stumble on as you were reading it. My dad was a writer, so I, I felt a pressure to, you know, try and do a good job and not write something that he would have read and just been rolling his eyes at. Like, oh, terrible. Oh, the grammar. Oh, the cliches. Oh, it's so sloppy. So I was trying to, to make it a good book to actually read with your eyes. But at the same time, I was well aware that a lot of the people that would be coming to it would be doing so having listened to my podcast. And so, and probably that was the reason that I got asked to write the book in the first place, you know. So the audio book was really important to me, but it also helped that I, I spoke to an American writer called David Sedaris, who's a brilliant uh, humorist. And when he talked to me on my podcast, one of the things he said was that he prepares part of the process of writing for him is reading stuff aloud at live shows. And that's how he generates his material. And that's how he hones it very much like a comedian does in some ways, except comedians generally don't just read off the page in that way. You know, they tend to extemporize and maybe make some notes. For David Sedaris, he is literally just writing things down, reading them off his laptop at spoken word shows. So he'll read a piece that is already in a published book, but then he'll read something that he's working on at the same time. And for him, hearing it out loud is very useful to get a sense of whether it flows nicely. And it's also very useful to find out how an audience responds to, to, to that. Now, of course, it's quite different when you're writing a book and you don't necessarily need to worry about how a live audience is going to respond to a printed piece, but it's certainly a useful thing to hear it out loud. You know, you can read a sentence or you can write a sentence and be quite pleased with it. But then when you actually start speaking it, you immediately realize, oh, it's quite ungainly or it's easy to trip up. Like it, it's a bit of a mouthful. Or you hear a word that you thought, oh, that's a clever word. I'm going to use that clever word because that's going to make me look pretty clever. And then it immediately sticks out and you realize that's not something I would ever say. And again, it's not like you have to only write in a collo colloquial style, but definitely if it sounds good when you're saying it out loud, then that's a good indication that it might be all right. Uh, so did you do any of that with Ramble Book, at any of your shows? Or Yeah, I did. Yeah, inspired by David Sedaris. I thought, okay, well, that's... And it was a really massive help, actually. So I ended up just booking some shows in very small venues. Uh, there was a venue in King's Cross called The Invisible Dot, which is now called Two North Down. Really nice venue. And it's, um, you know, you can only fit like 100 people in there or something, max. So that was great because it was a nice little group of supportive people who were already vaguely well disposed towards me, you know what I mean? Who wanted yeah. me to do well. And that's good. It's like, I'm not going to go and start reading out 
things I'm working on in a big club where everybody hates me or doesn't know who I am. I don't think that would be useful. But um, that was really that was really instructive because even though they were well disposed, that doesn't mean to say they're going to laugh at everything. And if I read out something that doesn't work or is just totally boring, then I was met with silence and that was useful. I mean, there are other times, though, when you don't get anything, but you don't get anything because people don't know how to respond. Or maybe it's sad and it's not appropriate for them to be laughing or something like that. I did get one comment from a friend who came to see me about some stuff I wrote about my dad that I read out at one of those evenings. And he said, oh, that was great. There's, there's so much funny stuff in there. You could probably lose the, some of those bits about your dad were a little bit, bah, a bit boring. And they certainly hadn't set the room on fire or they, they didn't feel as if they had in that little live club. Actually, that was another club called the Bill Murray. And um, I was a bit rattled by that. But actually, I, I stood my ground and I, I read them back and I tinkered with those bits about my dad. And I thought, well, actually, this is a good example of something that is going to be a bit weirder to read out in front of an audience but it is doing a job and I am confident that it's worth keeping in there. And I'm definitely glad I did. I mean, for some people, those are the, you know, for some people they're like, yeah, yeah, I don't need to know about David Bowie anymore. Thanks very much. Or all the films that you watched in 1985 and they, they latch onto the dad stuff as being a bit more substantial. I guess this might be a good point to ask. Was it difficult? So obviously you write about your dad in a very uh, like sensitive way, but there's also a lot of jokes in those parts as well. And was it difficult to write about your dad in a, a funny way as well? Or does that sort of just come naturally to you to write about more difficult things still with humour as well? I suppose there's always a danger that humour is going to be a defence mechanism and something that creates a barrier between you and the truth or how you really feel or something. But I do think you can use both. Uh, it was difficult writing about my dad. The main thing I didn't want to do was just throw him under the bus, you know? Just to just complain about him, say, oh, he hurt my feelings and he didn't really support me very much and he didn't like a lot of what I was doing. And that's left me with lasting mental scars that have affected my self-esteem, all of which I think is partly true, <laughs> by the <laughs> way. But it's not the whole story. You know what I mean? I don't think it only in very few cases, I think, is, is a, the story of your relationship with your parents or particularly with your parents, that is well complicated. And there's all sorts of forces at work. You know, parts of you really love them, but at the same, but you can, you can love them at the same time as just finding bits of them completely appalling, not agreeing with their views maybe, or just being irritated by so much of what they do. And also just being hurt when they don't, respond the way you want them to and all these things you know man it's a it's a complicated set of emotional forces at work and i wanted to i knew that i wasn't ever going to be able to communicate all of those things but i wanted to acknowledge them at least and try and accommodate some of them y you know one of the things i talk about in the book is being sent to boarding school and how i felt quite conflicted about that in some ways and how i do feel as if it created quite a weird relationship with my parents that was a bit more distant than I would have preferred. And I don't know, it's just a weird thing, I think, to do is to send away a nine-year-old child and just say, bye, you're going to live in a weird house for a while now and we'll see you in, you know, three months or whatever. But at the same time, I know that my dad did it for the best uh, you know, with the best of intentions, him and my mum agreed that it was a, a worthwhile thing to do. And they certainly were not doing it so they could screw me up. You know what I mean? So I, I, I feel as if, you know, I can be a, a bit cynical about some of those decisions that he made or, or maybe criticise them to some degree. But at the same time, I don't want to give the impression that I'm totally ungrateful because I got, you know, many advantages and privileges and breaks from from some of those things that my dad and my mum did for me 
even though it was kind of their undoing because they bankrupted themselves in the process sending us to those schools. Uh, and how uh, does writing a book and creating the audiobook about yourself, how does it compare to uh, doing your podcast and interviewing other people? Is, is either one easier? Well, it's, the podcast is definitely easier because um, I am able to leech off funny, interesting, talented and creative people. <laughs> Whereas doing the book, I'm only able to leech off my stupid self. And even though, you know, I don't want to put myself down. Of course, I'm incredible and um, brilliant and <laughs> hilarious. But uh, it is tough sometimes to think like I, I spent a very long time thinking who gives a uh, flip about any of this stuff. You know what I mean? Like, does anyone care about any of these memories or anything like this? Because it felt so trivial, a lot of it. Um, but my editor was very helpful in that respect and said, listen, you know, just get over yourself. I think people understand you are not one of the foremost political commentators of your generation. That's not why they're buying your book. Just try and be honest and straightforward and funny as much as possible. And that's all you can do. I think that's probably a normal human response if you're writing about your own life to think, does anyone who, who wants to read it? Because if, I don't know, I, I suppose if I was writing something and I thought at every sentence, yes, everyone would, everyone wants to know about this, then I think maybe it'd be quite narcissistic. So <laughs> I think yeah. that's probably a very normal way to, to respond to like your own writing. Yeah. I, I mean, I used to remind myself though be that, well, I like hearing about other people's lives, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I know some people, I've heard some people saying that their least favorite part of an autobiography is the beginning chapters when they talk about their childhood. They're like, just skip to the famous parts. <laughs> but actually, I really like those. If someone writes well about those formative years, I, I love it. And I think it's really compelling. And if someone is good with the detail of their lives. I find it really interesting and entertaining. Steve Coogan's uh, book was very good on that. I don't know if he wrote it with someone else or what, but mm. the level of detail and observation about his childhood was fantastic. And I really, really enjoyed reading that. And I liked it when he did get to the famous parts as well, but I certainly yeah. didn't feel like, come on, get on with it. You know, so I was encouraged yeah. by that. So out of everything you've done, you've worked across so many mediums like TV, film and radio and podcasts and your books. Um, do you prefer any one in particular or is that too difficult to answer? <laughs> well, I guess overall, I do love podcasting. I really think that that's been a good place for me and it, uh, it's somewhere I can do as good a job as I'm capable of doing, I think. And um, I'm not saying I've absolutely nailed it. I'm not saying there's no room for improvement. I am sure there is. And I continue to try and improve and learn from my mistakes. But as far as like the, the ratio of satisfaction and creativity uh, to frustration and disappointment is much, much better for me in podcasting than it was, for example, in TV. There was just a there was a lot of angst and um, disappointment with TV, and so much of it you're at the mercy of other people and the decisions of executives and things like that. And uh, it is frequently maddening and frustrating. Even though I really love the stuff I did with Joe, and I've been watching a lot of it back this year because I was digitizing a huge library of tapes which included all the rushes for the shows we made together on channel four that i still have and it was fun looking back over that stuff and it and it reminded me like oh yeah we had a pretty good time and we were very lucky i mean we did four series or something um and the idea of just being able to get a show and do it exactly the way you wanted with very little interference just seems bizarre now I don't think you could really do that on TV anymore. I guess that's why people do stuff online. But um, yeah, for me, I don't really want to be on camera too much anymore because I'm old and gnarly now. <laughs> so I like, uh, I like the audio medium. And I think it's 
I found it personally very enjoyable and relaxing to listen to audiobooks and other podcasts. And so I like being part of that experience for, for other people. I think you can get to places, you can achieve a level of kind of meaningful or semi-meaningful connection that you really can't in a lot of other media, you know? Yeah. Like TV was fun, but 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 it, what we were doing, me and Joe on TV, was it was a different thing. It was just being silly. And I think, uh, I think with a podcast, you can be, it can accommodate almost anything within one episode. You can be silly and trivial and, um, do fart jokes, but you can also kind of talk about really important things and politics and the meaning of life. And I don't know. Yeah. yeah you can fit it yeah. all in. You can maybe change the tone up a bit more than might you might be able to in a tv show perhaps yeah exactly I think yeah yeah so uh you've possibly already just answered this but do you do you like audiobooks yourself do you like listening to a lot of audiobooks yeah i love audiobooks i think the thing for me with audiobooks is that it encourages me to explore books that maybe I wouldn't buy in physical form because I I would feel maybe that they were a bit intimidating or maybe just not my kind of thing. And so I would pass over them and stick to something that I knew was going to be up my alley. But with an audio book, I find myself being a bit more adventurous. And then I end up talking to some of those people on the podcast. Um, so it works really nicely for me, actually. And I've made some good discoveries via audio books of authors that I don't think I would have explored otherwise. Jeff Vandermeer, that was a good recommendation from someone i read his book born which was really strange and oh yeah shoshana zuboff wrote this book called the the age of surveillance capitalism about digital surveillance and digital rights and things like that and um that was i mean i bought the physical book as well which was like a doorstop the the audio book was close to how long was it 24 hours over 24 hours <laughs> so that was one of those things that i used to just stick it on every time i was out for a walk or doing some manual labor or you know making lunch or i don't know what and it was really good that it just sort of sunk in and then i would cross reference bits that i wanted to remember and make notes of in the actual physical copy so that worked out really well for me. And, I, I, you know, I was never a good reader when I was young. I hated reading. To me, it just seemed boring and too much like hard work. And I struggled to understand a lot of it. I don't know if I was mildly dyslexic or not. I don't think so. I think I was just not good with concentration and a bit lazy. So I always felt intimidated by books. And I think that's there to some degree. And, and audio books have really, really helped me a bit beyond that, you know. What are you working on next? Well, I mean, I think I'm going to try and write a sequel to Ramble Book because one of the responses I got from a few people who'd read the book was, oh, why didn't you write more about Joe and working with Joe? I mean, I wrote a lot about the formation of my friendship with Joe, but I didn't write so much about the stuff we'd done on TV. There was a little bit about it, but but not very much. I made a conscious decision, actually, me and my editor, not to write very much about it. But um, I do want to write another thing that, that maybe focuses a bit more on what's it, what it's like to work with your best friend and, and to make a TV show and uh, to tell some of the stories about working together in the 90s. And rather than going through what I was doing in the 80s, as I did in Ramble Book, the next one would be about uh, the 90s. And so some of the stuff that was a big influence on me from that decade um, and how it fitted in with me evolving as a person. I mean, I was a bit of a massive dick in the 90s, if I'm honest. <laughs> I think a lot of people would want to hear about that, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. Would you want to tell it? <laughs> well, that's the question. It's tr it's tricky. I think it's maybe, it feels as if it might be trickier to write about <laughs> than the 80s. Because in the 80s, I was just an adolescent. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't a fully fledged person. But in the 90s, I mean, I was, I shouldn't be allowed to write a book. 
what kind of thing is that to say? I wasn't a fully fledged person. Of course I was. <laughs> but it feels as if like once you're in your 20s, then you, you should be taking a bit more responsibility for the kind of person you are and the and the things you do. And actually, I was a I was more of a disaster area in my 20s than I was in my teens. So I would write about that. And I would also write about my mother because I felt that, um, you know, when I was writing the other book, my mum was still alive and she died this year in 2020. And so it feels as if um, now would be the time to to talk about her. She was so important to me in so many ways. And um, I would write about that and, uh, yeah, try and be honest about that relationship as far as possible. Great. So Ramble Book 2 is... Ramble Book 2, uh, possible. Don't know. Possible, question mark. Okay. In talks. But um, I have done or I've, yeah, I've been involved with many things that haven't actually seen the light of day <laughs> over the years. <laughs> so I don't want to make too many promises. Thanks so much to Amy and Adam for bringing us that conversation. And thank you for listening. Ramble Book is available now in both print and audio form if you're still hunting for just the right gift for someone. It's also one of the more than 9,000 titles in the Listening Books Library. Next week, Voluminous is back with the second of our two special 2020 episodes. This time, colleagues Amy and Abby will join me to talk about the books we've turned and returned to during this unforgettable year. We'll also hear from some authors and some of you who've told us on social media what books have kept you going. And there'll be a festive literary game at the end. So if you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast and we'll see you next week. Voluminous is produced by Listening Books, a UK charity providing audiobooks for over 100,000 members who have a disability or illness that impacts their ability to read the printed word. If that sounds like you or someone you know, you can find out how to access our more than 9,000 titles, including Ramble Book, by heading to www.listening-books.org.uk. 